Welcome back to another one of your flip lectures. Today, we're going to talk about American policy after World War II, a strategy known as containment. And so just to remind ourselves, the Cold War is going to be a conflict between the United States and Soviet Union, but fundamentally it's not military conflict, but an ideological conflict between Soviet-style communism and American-style capitalism and democracy. But at the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were both allies. And so obviously something would have to happen to break that alliance apart. And what happens is that fundamentally, after the war, the United States and Soviet Union have different goals. And so these different goals are going to end up leading to a clash of interests. The United States wants um, a economic growth and world peace, international trade, because they believe the Great Depression caused World War II. Whereas the Soviet Union is much more concerned about its security. It wants Western Europe as a buffer zone. Um, it wants the state to have control. And fundamentally, they are going to distrust all capitalist countries, including the United States. And so from the get-go, United States and Soviet Union are going to not be allied immediately after the Second World War. And so after World War II, the Soviet Union had expanded into new territories and it kept influence over those areas. So as you can see, everything in red is influenced by the Soviet Union. And so immediately after the end of World War II, there were several conflicts over what was going to happen to the territory that had previously been taken over by Nazi Germany. And so in Poland, they are supposed to have a democratic election, but instead a communist style government is set up under the control of the Soviet Union. There's also the division of Germany between West and East Germany, West Germany being uh, run and helped by the European democracies of the United States, and East Germany being a communist country. And so ultimately, all of these countries that are influenced by the United States or Soviet Union are known as satellite nations. And so if we take a look at this map, a couple of Soviet satellite nations would be Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and these are all influenced by the Soviet Union. So in 1945, the division of Germany is going to have two key components. The first is that the country itself is split between East Germany, controlled by the Soviet Union, West Germany, influenced by the United States. But within East Germany is the capital of Berlin. And Berlin is a major, Ameri is a major German city that the Americans did not want to give all of it up. And so even though the city of Berlin is right in the middle of East Germany, the city itself was actually split in two. So in the middle of East Germany, you have half a city that is controlled by West Germany. And so this becomes a central kind of area of conflict between the two powers. In terms of some terminology, uh, Winston Churchill described the world controlled by the Soviet Union as the Iron Curtain. And so that's a terminology that you will likely hear. So when you hear Iron Curtain, it refers to the secretive world behind Soviet control. And so both sides are going to end up feeling very insecure in this new world order. And so two competing alliances are created. The first, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, consists of the United States, Western Europe, and their allies. The Warsaw Pact, led by the Soviet Union, is going to include all the countries that are going to be aligned with uh, the Soviets. And so these two big military alliances are going to be pitted against each other for the entirety of the Cold War. But outside of the Soviet Union, there was also trouble happening in China. And during World War II, the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, um, and the Communist Party forces, which had been fighting a civil war, put that civil war aside to fight against the Japanese invasion. The U.S. supported the Nationalists under General Chiang Kai-shek, and at the end of the Second World War, the civil war is just going to resume along the lines of the Nationalist Party versus the Communist Party. And so the United States is going to support Chiang Kai-shek as the leader of the Chinese. But ultimately, during the Chinese Civil War, his side is going to lose. And in 1949, the communist Chinese, led by Mao Zedong, are going to take over power in China. And so what happens is the Chiang Kai-shek and the exiled government go to what is known as today as Taiwan. And so for this time, and still up to today, both governments claim to be the legitimate government of China. And so from 1958 to 1962, under the leadership of Mao Zedong, the Chinese attempt something called the Great Leap Forward in which they try to rapidly industrialize, rapidly socialize farms. But unfortunately, all of this kind of rapid change is going to lead to some serious drawbacks, including a famine. 
Uh, collective farming is not as efficient uh, nor as successful as individual farming, and so there's not going to be enough food to feed everyone in China, leading to a widespread famine. Additionally, uh, villages were asked to produce um, items like steel and iron, but this too is going to take a lot of resources and they don't have the proper industrial capacity to do all of these things yet. And so the result of the Great Leap Forward is actually going to be the Great Chinese Famine in which about 20 to 45 million are going to die. And so it's during this time that the communist Chinese are going to consolidate their power within the country. After the Great Leap Forward is going to come the Cultural Revolution, in which all of the kind of traditional Chinese ideas are going to be kind of set aside in favor of an, an embrace of communism and an embrace of Mao Zedong's thought. Um, this was also characterized by struggle sessions, where the bourgeoisie elements, those that uh, had owned businesses and land, were actually publicly humiliated, beaten, and often exiled or executed for their crimes against the, com crimes against the people. And so uh, within China, Mao's Little Red Book, a collection of sayings by the leader, becomes the most well-read book. And so ultimately, the cult of personality, similar to that of Stalin and Hitler, is going to be developed around the character of Mao Zedong. And on top of this, on top of the Communist Revolution in 1949, this is also the year that the Soviet Union is going to detonate its first nuclear weapon, the RDS-1. And so it's at this point that the world has now entered the age of atomic warfare. And so at this point, the stage for the Cold War was set. And so the United States would have to decide what its policy would be. And so the two presidents that will set America's early policy are Harry S. Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower. And so there's a lot of questions about what should the United States do about both the Soviet Union and the potential spread of communism throughout the world. And so to answer this question, the United States asked George Kennan, who was, the so who was the Soviet ambassador, to basically come up with a paper describing what he believed about the Soviet Union. And in this long telegram, he said that the Soviet Union is characterized by this fear of a long-term struggle with capitalism and a belief that the two societies cannot peacefully coexist. And so because of this, the policy becomes very simple. If they stop the USSR from expanding communism, then eventually George Kennan believed communism would collapse on its own within the Soviet Union. And so the US policy becomes like a game of chess to contain all spread of communism outside of the Soviet Union. And so a big piece of this is this question of political revolution that happened after World War I. And as we looked at with both the Nazis um, as well as the Italian fascists, it is the poverty after the war that led to the rise of radicals. And so what the United States did in their first act of economic containment was to create the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan pledged $13 billion to rebuild Europe and bring them into the world capital, back into the world capitalist economy. And the belief was that if the countries were doing well financially, communist revolution would be less likely. And also there was this hope that loyalty could be bought at the price of rebuilding. The Soviet Union was also offered the Marshall Plan, but they refused. And so there are kind of a lot of money as well as a lot of propaganda that is going to put out, especially in countries like Germany, who had been defeated by the Americans, that they should certainly now support and join with the free countries of the world. Um, in a great political cartoon, Joseph Stalin is shown as blocking the Marshall Plan from getting to the Soviet people, regardless of the necessity of it. So the second form that containment is going to take is that of proxy wars. And proxy wars is when opposing powers are going to use third party countries in order to fight for them. And so two great examples of proxy wars are going to be Korea and Vietnam. And this poster, I think, illustrates this idea of kind of one country pushing another country into war. And so Harry Truman, reelected in 1948 as president, comes up with America's strategy for military containment. It says that the United States will support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. And basically what this meant was that the U.S. would intervene with guns or military intervention um, that any place is threatened by communism. And so this shows up very, very early on in the Cold War during, um, during civil wars that were happening in Greece and Turkey. 
In Greece and Turkey, there were civil wars between communists and between the government, um, which was basically pro-West, pro-democracy. And so what the United States did is pledge $400 million plus dollars to arm the governments of Greece and Turkey to resist the communist revolutions. The Soviet Union supplied the other side, and these are considered to be the early and first proxy wars. But the largest proxy war that is going to be fought in this early era is going to be the Korean War. And so the Korean War goes back uh, to Kim Il-sung, who is a communist leader that leads the resistance against the Japanese during the Korean War. And so what ends up happening is that after World War II, Korea is going to be partitioned in half, with the Soviet Union occupying the North, controlled by Kim Il-sung and the communists, and the United States occupying South Korea, which, it, which had a uh, pro-U.S. government. There was a promise to hold free elections in order for uh, there to be a unification between North and South Korea, but that net election never happened. Both sides did not feel that they knew the outcome, and so the North declared itself uh, to be independent and communist and invaded South Korea. And so it's at this point that the United States has to decide if they're going to step in to prevent the spread of communism into South Korea. And so the United States decides to do this. And so they put in U.S. soldiers into Korea in order to try to stop the spread of communism. And so if we take a look at the phases of the Korean War, the North invades the South and nearly conquers all of it. But then with American help, the United States and the South Koreans push all the way up to the Yalulu River in the border of China. But it's at this point that the Chinese communists, afraid that the U.S. troops would come into their area, decide to get involved in the war as well. And so now you have North Korea supported with arms by the USSR, supported with troops by the Chinese, and South Korea supported by the Americans. And ultimately, this war is going to end in a deadlock in the creation of separate North and South Koreas. And so it's this idea that um, kind of Korea is going to stay divided, and it stays divided until this day. As UN and US forces retreat back to the original border, uh, the armistice that is going to end this war um, means that the Korean War still has technically not ended. There has never been a treaty. They just have not fought since uh, the armistice. And so today, uh, dividing Korea is going to be a 2.5 mile demilitarized zone, but it's a very, very dangerous area, and there are still many issues left over from the war today. And so Korea is the best example we have right now of a proxy war. The Soviet Union supported China and North Korea. Chinese troops participated on one side. And the U.S. And the US participated on the other side, leading to a toll of 2.5 million casualties on all sides, solely about the spread of communism from North to South Korea. Though we call Korea the Forgotten War, it is one of the most influential moments in Cold War history. And so the demilitarized zone today uh, is still considered one of the most dangerous borders. And oftentimes, people are not even allowed to come anywhere close to visit. But as far as the United States was concerned, their intervention in Korea was justified because they believed that they saved South Korea from the fate of becoming communists like the North. This is a satellite image showing North and South Korea. And what Americans would say is that all the lights in South Korea are proof that they have prospered more under American influence than the North has under communist influence. But uh, this war still colors our relationship with North Korea today. We are considered to be their primary villain. Um, in Korean museums, they have, um, they have museum uh, exhibits that talk about American war crimes that didn't happen, including you know throwing babies down wells and all sorts of things like that. And so when we look at our relationship with North Korea today, it is fundamentally colored by this experience of the, the Korean War. But what all this meant is that America would now have to be involved in the world. The days of isolationism are over. Which leads us to Dwight D. Eisenhower, who took over office in 1952 to 1960. Now, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the commander of all Allied forces in World War II, a man that had seen what had happened after the Second World, at the First World War, and was hoping not to repeat that same, all those same mistakes after the Second World War. And so Eisenhower runs for president, and he wins in a landslide against the Illinois government Adelaide, governor Adelaide Stevenson. And so the war hero. 
takes over, and he fundamentally changes American foreign policy where Truman had favored the idea of containment, going in with using um, kind of money as well as military troops to stop the spread of communism. Eisenhower is going to have a different approach where he's going to use the threat of nuclear weapons to negotiate. And so a new, a new uh, strategy is entered into the Cold War. We call it MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction or Massive Retaliation. And this is the idea of using the atomic bomb in order to threaten countries into compromises. And so we call this brinksmanship because this is like poker. You are bluffing more than reacting where you are trying to convince the other side that you are willing to use these nuclear weapons in order to defend your allies. When China considered an attack of Taiwan to destroy that government once and for all, the United States made it clear that they would consider using nuclear weapons, and they ended up successfully shielding Taiwan. And so Eisenhower's plan is rather than having a large and expensive army, have a large arsenal of nuclear weapons. And so Eisenhower brought the Korean War to an end, and he believed that this strategy of kind of using the massive retaliation of nuclear weapons provided more bang for the buck and allowed America to win diplomatic fights without actually fighting. And one of the big reasons that Dwight D. Eisenhower believed this is that he did not want that much money spent in the military. Going as far as to say every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. And this world is in, ar in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its labor, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. And this is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. And he also went on to warn about the military-industrial complex and the influence of potential wars without end on the American people. But during Eisenhower's time, other things are going to happen. In Cuba, Fidel Castro is going to lead a communist revolution just 90 miles off of the border of the United States, leaving the election of 1960, the election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, in a very difficult spot in the Cold War. But when he was inaugurated, Kennedy, prom Kennedy promised to keep containment and the Truman Doctrine alive. When he said, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And JFK's words would soon be tested as the Cold War escalated into the crisis of the Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis.